Coming up on Bridge City News, seven COVID-19 cases hit Lethbridge College. We will explain where at the facility. The province of Manitoba has implemented new COVID-19 measures as cases there continue to rise. And as we lead up to the U.S. federal election, both Trump and Biden make one last ditch effort to secure more votes. Your nation, your province, your Southern Alberta, from the heart of Lethbridge, it's Bridge City News with Hal Roberts. Thanks so much for joining us. A COVID-19 outbreak has been declared within Lethbridge College's Powerline Technician Program with seven cases of the virus. The college says there is little risk since the cohort was not on the main campus. All affected people are self-isolating. The college says they're working with Alberta Health Services to prevent the spread of the virus. Scheduled labs and classes continued at the college today. College officials say if you were not contacted, then you are not affected. Alberta Health Services has been working with Lethbridge School Division as various schools in our region have been dealing with COVID-19 cases. The most recent is an outbreak at Wilson Middle School where there are at least two confirmed cases of the virus. Galbraith Elementary School was also recently notified by AHS that they've identified one case at their school. Close contacts were notified and instructed to quarantine for 14 days. Both schools proceeded as normal earlier today. Alberta, meanwhile, has reported 622 cases of COVID-19 on Friday. That's the highest single-day count to date. The record-breaking day increased active infections to 5,172, which is also a pandemic high. The Edmonton and Calgary health zones each have more than 2,000 cases. Alberta Health also reported five deaths, bringing the provincial total to 323. Hospitalizations also set new highs with 140 patients with COVID-19, including 25 in intensive care. Fortunately, more than 22,100 Albertans have also recovered from the virus. Just under a month ago, Lethbridge City Council approved around $6 million in funding for community agencies as part of the Community Wellbeing and Safety Strategy. It was to target homelessness and provide programs and services for our city. Today, Council approved a second round of funding with just under $4 million. Martin Thompson from the City of Lethbridge says this money comes more from intervention prevention dollars as opposed to round one of funding. So although there were some, again, some emergency kind of homelessness dollars sprinkled in there because we did get another allotment from the federal government here literally a couple weeks ago. So again, uh, the bulk of these were what's called family and community support services dollars and they're meant for intervention prevention. And so when I talk about, you know, the funding pots and the restrictions with it, the FCSS program does not allow you to use those dollars for things like homelessness or kind of an emergency response use, more the intervention prevention piece. And that was the bulk of these funds. The programs will most likely be rolled out by January 1st of next year. City Council also announced the new money will be dished out to Lethbridge business owners, investors and agencies. There are six areas of focus within the community and just over $4 million will be given out as part of an incentive-based program to help with economic recovery. The money is coming out as part of the Lethbridge Recovery Committee of Council and will cover certain areas including real estate sales, urban grant recovery and a housing incentive program. Blood Tribe Police say they have found the truck of Jason Manyfingers along with unidentified human remains at Spring Glen Park in Alberta. Manyfingers has not been seen since he last filled up his truck at a fast gas gas station September 20th in Pincher Creek. The body was sent to Calgary this week for an autopsy. Canada's Chief of Defence Staff says a soldier who died after being shot during a training exercise in Alberta will be remembered. Jonathan Vance says Corporal James Choi died serving Canada. The 29-year-old Army Reservist from British Columbia was shot late Friday night while taking part in live fire training at CFB Wainwright. Choi was part of the Royal Westminster Regiment and was serving alongside members of the Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry at the time of the incident. Systemic racism. Now, it's a term we've heard quite a bit over the past year, especially in the United States. When it comes to systemic racism in Canada, apparently we also have a problem. That's according to Ricardo Fortune with the group Faith Beyond Belief. Fortune says just because the issue does not lead to as much violence as it does south of the border doesn't mean that we should be complacent. When the situation uh, like the recent killing of George Floyd happened, uh, this uh, evidently uh, uh, led to a lot of violence. However, here in Canada, well, we, we haven't reached that boiling point yet. Well, we, we shouldn't be complacent and, until, uh, and wait until things erupt 
and get out of hands uh, uh, before we decide to address what's happening in our own backyard. And uh, I would say that the church and uh, our government need to listen to the complaints of ethnic uh, uh, diversities, ethnic minorities, especially those of the indigenous people. Catch the entire interview with Ricardo Fortune from Faith Beyond Belief and Jeanette Roche coming up later in our program. The Chinook Regional Hospital Foundation is canceling their in-person Christmas tree festival due to the COVID-19 pandemic. They will, however, be providing an online version of the event this year where they will highlight the best looking trees from the past five years. For those who were able to, the Chinook Regional Hospital Foundation will still be accepting donations for this year. There is still no budget for Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's promised 2 billion trees to be planted by the year 2030. Assistant Deputy Minister at the Canadian Forest Service told the House of Commons Natural Resources Committee that while consultations are underway, the service is still waiting to be given a budget for the program. Canada plants around 600 million trees annually. Trudeau's election promise would add an additional 200 million to the annual total. Another five people have died from COVID-19 in Manitoba, including four more deaths connected with outbreaks at St. Boniface Hospital and long-term care homes. Health officials also reported 241 new cases, bringing the total number of infections to 6,275 since the start of the pandemic. Manitoba Premier Brian Pallister is considering imposing a curfew to try and stem the growing number of coronavirus cases. COVID numbers are rising, and it's not due to a lack of awareness of the issue on the part of the people of Manitoba. Most people in Manitoba, 99%, I'll say, have been behaving responsibly. They've been behaving in a thoughtful manner, in a considerate manner. All, uh, almost all Manitobans have been making sacrifices through this very challenging time, this unprecedented time. But the number of people infected in the lower age category has been steadily increasing and significantly so. Uh, we also know there's a greater likelihood of uh, the dangers now of group gatherings. We're social people and group gatherings are a danger. Uh, as a consequence of our red rules, uh, group gatherings and orange rules, group, group gatherings of over five people are restricted. Still with Manitoba, that province has become the murder capital of Canada and it's not the only crime on the rise. According to Stats Canada, Manitoba recorded 72 homicides in 2019. That is 17 more than in 2018 and gives Manitoba the highest homicide rate per capita in the country. Shoplifting in Manitoba was also up 48%. That compares to the national average of just 11%. The province says it is reviewing the recent report from the federal agency. Meanwhile, in Ontario, the government there is promising to establish a new standard that would see nursing home residents receive an average of four hours of direct care each and every day. Ontario Premier Doug Ford pledged to have the new standard achieved by 2024-2025. The Commission has already delivered early recommendations to improve resident care. We're taking those very seriously, and that's why we're here today. We are wasting no time in starting to act on one of those key recommendations immediately. In the upcoming 2020 Ontario budget, we will be increasing average daily direct care in our homes to four hours a day compared to the uh, the 2.75 hours. Now, to put that into perspective, folks, that's over 31% increased care for our loved ones. Quebec's Premier says pandemic-related restrictions need to stay despite the impact they're having on people's mental health. Francois Legault says his government has no choice since health authorities continue to report around 1,000 new COVID-19 infections each and every day. We are adding uh, services, personnel, uh, for treating uh, mental health uh, problems. Uh, of course, it's not an easy choice, an easy balance uh, between those restrictions and the number of deaths uh, we see uh, every day. So uh, it's a balance. Uh, all governments are trying to find this balance, but as you can see, uh, most of the measures we have in Quebec, we have the same measures all around the world. A committee of humble Bronco parents is working on creating a permanent memorial at the site of the deadly bus crash, which killed 16 people in 2018. There's no timeline, but many are pushing to have it built as soon as possible. A makeshift memorial that began to grow days after the crash is now weather beaten. The mayor of nearby Tisdale, Saskatchewan, says it's surprising the number of vehicles that stopped there. 
A man dressed in medieval clothing and armed with a Japanese sword was arrested on Sunday on the suspicion of killing two people and injuring five others on Halloween near the historic Chateau Frontenac Hotel in Quebec City. The 24-year-old man is now facing first-degree murder charges. Residents in Quebec City pay tribute to Suzanne Claremont, one of the two victims of the Halloween night stabbing rampage. Claremont, who was 61, and 56-year-old Francois Duchesne were killed in the attack. Since the confinement in March, you know, we, we were hanging out at the end of the street here to talk among neighbors, you know, and that was the only way we, we bonded more. We bonded more during, over the summer, and uh, I mean, it's unbelievable. We ju I just can't still compute, so imagine Jacques, you know, her conjoint. That it happens so close to, to one's place is also something you don't, uh, you don't imagine, like how it affects you more, much more than hearing about the news when it's further from your place. U.S. President Donald Trump continues to campaign on the day before the federal election. He's suggesting that he will fire the nation's top infectious disease expert, Dr. Anthony Fauci, if he's re-elected. COVID, 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 COVID. We'd like to talk about COVID and then next time. Here's what happens, November 4th. You won't hear too much about it. You won't hear too much about it. Don't tell anybody, but let me wait till a little bit after the election. Please. I appreciate the advice. I appreciate it. Joe Biden was campaigning in Michigan, and he says the COVID-19 pandemic has actually taken the blinders off of the American people. You know, this is a pretty dark time for the country. But the point is, the irony of all ironies is, I think what's happened with these quadruple problems we have from the pandemic to what's going on relative to the, uh, uh, the racial unease, the unemployment, the recession, as well as our situation internationally. It's taking the blinders off the American people. Now there's talk if Joe Biden gets elected tomorrow, he will put roadblocks up when it comes to the Keystone XL pipeline. And that's not good news for Alberta's energy sector. Biden's climate package is pegged at around $2 trillion U.S. And he has plans of putting the United States on a path to achieve net zero emissions. Cody Battershill, the founder of Canada Action, says if the Keystone XL pipeline does not go through, it would benefit many, but not Canadians. The biggest benefactors of the opposition to Keystone were Venezuela, Mexico, Saudi Arabia, Brazil, and Ecuador, countries that obviously do not support Canadian jobs, and also countries that often have inferior environmental, social, and, and governance standards. So a very important part of the conversation really is who benefits when Canadian pipelines are blocked. Catch the full interview with Cody Battershill with Canada Action as he also discusses how the push for green energy will impact Alberta. That's coming up after business news. While preaching from his truck in southern England, evangelist Dominic Muir was grabbed by a police officer and forced to leave the area. As we hear in this next report, during the lockdown, Christian ministries treated as non-essential by the UK government have been clamped down upon. A Christian charity leader has been given the first lockdown-related compensation from Dorset Police in the south of England after reports that he was manhandled and unlawfully prevented from preaching on the back of his truck. Following support from the Christian Legal Centre, police have now paid street preacher Dominic Muir £1,250 in damages and costs. Muir explains what led to him being stopped from preaching by a Dorset police officer. Well, I don't have to move on. I've done this all over the county. I've done this all over the country. I, I don't want this to start becoming an issue because I'm going to need you to move on. I'm going to need you to produce some paperwork to say that you were entitled to do that here. After a little bit of a kind of uh, back and forth, uh, a little bit of antagonism, but, but relatively peaceful, he said, OK, well, you can have a few minutes. And I think he gave me three minutes or something. And as I was wrapping it up, he... Um, he proceeded to mount my vehicle in a kind of quite an aggressive way, really, as it basically to put a stop to it and uh, prove that point by grabbing me uh, by the wrist. In this hour, and I'm finishing, I'm finishing with this, we need to not fear man, we need to fear God. May God bless you. 
Have a great afternoon. Thanks so much. Muir says it was humiliating to be treated like a common criminal. It was physically painful. It was quite shocking. It was intimidating. It was also shaming. Um, it was humiliating. You know, when you're having to be stopped by a, an officer of the law, you know, policeman, then you, you know, that the association you have with that is you're, is you're, you're going to be arrested. You're a criminal. He concluded by sharing his hopes that this legal victory will inspire other Christians to be bold in sharing the gospel during these uncertain times. Right now we're in the middle of a pandemic where there is, people are committing suicide, there is mass depression, there is domestic violence, people are losing their jobs. Never has the need for spiritual hope, the message of the gospel, the message of the love of God, the message of salvation been as necessary as it is now. It feels more like summer than fall for most of southern Alberta this week, and we should be seeing double-digit temperatures for most of the week until the weekend. Full weather details are coming up. Now, what's that expression in southern Alberta? If you don't like the weather, you wait five minutes? Well, for this week, it's wait five days. Jeanette Rocher is here now with a full look at the weather forecast. Jeanette, so we'll have sunshine and warm temperatures for most of the week, and then the potential of snow by the weekend? Yeah, well, it's going to be a beautiful, sunny week, and we don't want to focus on that white stuff just yet, but it's coming on the weekend for sure. Uh, today, we reached our high of 21 degrees. It was a beautiful day. Into this evening, partly cloudy skies, but could see a west wind gusting to 60 kilometers per hour. Overnight low, 6 degrees. Into tomorrow, lots of sunshine. Uh, winds gusting to 60 near noon as well. 18 degrees will be the high for tomorrow. 10 degrees, the overnight low. Not too bad. As we look further into the week into Wednesday. Uh, conditions will be sunny and windy for Wednesday. 17 the high, 13 the high for Thursday with a mix of sun and cloud. Increasing clouds on Friday with a high of 5 degrees. Now look what's happening on Friday night. We could see temperatures drop to as low as minus 10 because we are going to start to see a chance of showers turning to snow flurries overnight on Friday into Saturday. So we could see a chance of flurries on a Saturday high of a minus four and periods of snow as well on a Sunday minus four the high. Like I said, we didn't want to focus on that white stuff, but it looks like it's coming back to us regardless. Average high for this time of year, eight degrees. Compare that to what we were at today with the 21. Uh, low, minus four rather is the average low. 23 was the high temperature on this day in 1981 and 20 minus 25 was the chilliest day on record that was in 1991. 7.23 was the sunrise this morning and the sunset this evening, 5.07 p.m. So we are definitely seeing a difference there as we had our time change over the weekend. We fell back an hour. Felt good to get an extra hour of sleep for sure. Over on the West Coast tomorrow, uh, rainy conditions, high of 12 degrees in both Victoria and Vancouver. Vancouver could see heavy rains tomorrow, 32 40 uh, millimeters of rain could be expected. 16 the high in Calgary and 12 tomorrow in Edmonton with a mix of sun and cloud. As that beautiful weather, these trends continue across the prairies into tomorrow, 17 the high tomorrow in Saskatoon. Same thing for Regina, 14 the high in Winnipeg under sunny skies across all the prairies. So the prairies are definitely where the warm weather is happening this week and compared to Central Canada and the East Coast. We got lots of precipitation rains in Toronto, high of seven, high of one in Ottawa, high of two in Montreal. Both of those cities could see chance of flurries in the morning, switching to rain by the afternoon. Fredericton's high two tomorrow with a mix of sun and cloud. Charlottetown could also see a chance of flurries tomorrow with a high of one. Uh, Halifax high four degrees, could see some snow as well. And rain's expected in St. John's Newfoundland with a high of eight degrees tomorrow. There you go, that is your weather. Canada's top banker says an economic rebound that leaves behind parts of the workforce in the short term could jeopardize the recovery from COVID-19 in the long term. Bank of Canada Governor Tiff Macklem says the longer people are out of work, the harder it will be for them to find new jobs. He says more people may likely give up looking for work altogether. He warns the combined results of impacts on workers and businesses could severely weigh down the economy, affecting even those who are doing comparatively well. Small business owners say their biggest complaint against Google is that its advertising policies favor companies with big marketing budgets. 
Companies cover the top spots in Google search results, but if too many companies are interested, the cost of the spots can be out of reach for a small business owner. Google controls around 90% of global internet searches. The U.S. Justice Department sued Google last week, charging that it uses monopoly power in search to squelch competition. The Bank of Nova Scotia says outgoing Air Canada executive Kalen Ravinescu has joined its board. The announcement comes after Ravinescu announced that he will retire from the airline in February as it struggles to rebuild amid the COVID-19 pandemic. Ravinescu served as the airline's president and chief executive for over 10 years. He also led the company's restructuring in 2003 and 2004. McDonald's is hiring a new chief diversity officer as it struggles with charges of harassment and racism at all levels of the company. Reginald Miller will become the company's global chief diversity equity and inclusion officer next week. He was previously the chief diversity officer at VF Corporation. That is the owner of brands such as the North Face and Timberland. Chicago-based McDonald's fired its former CEO, Steve Easterbrook, last November after he admitted to sending explicit text messages to an employee. Now, here's a look at today's markets. The TSX was up 116 points today to finish at 15,695. The Dow was up 423 on the day to 26,925. The S&P 500 was up 40 points to 33.10, and the Nasdaq was up 46 points on the day to 10,957. West Texas Intermediate Oil was up $1.25 to 37.04 U.S. per barrel. Natural gas was down 12 cents to 3.23 U.S. Gold was down 15 cents to 18.95.33 U.S. an ounce, and silver was down a cent to 24.08 U.S. an ounce. Wheat is at $269 per metric ton. Barley's at $268, canola's at $535, and corn is at $270 per metric ton. Live cattle were up 25 cents to $108.55, feeder cattle were down 8 cents to $134.05, and lean hogs were up 38 cents to $65.95. The Canadian dollar was up slightly over the past 24 hours to $75.66 US. Recapping one of our top stories this hour, a COVID-19 outbreak has been declared within Lethbridge College's Powerline Technician Program with seven cases of the virus. The college says there is little risk since the cohort was not on the main campus. All affected are self-isolating. The college says they are working with Alberta Health Services to prevent the spread of the virus. Systemic racism is not only prominent in the United States, but it's rearing its ugly head here in Canada. Coming up, Jeanette Rocher chats with Ricardo Fortune from Faith Beyond Belief about how racism is growing in many sectors of Canada, including certain police forces. That Q&A is on deck. Racism is one of the big issues that comes up during elections, and it's getting a lot of discussion lately. Does Canada have a systemic racism problem, though? is the church racist. Today's guest is Ricardo Fortune, the Quebec coordinator for Faith Beyond Belief, an apologetics organization based out of Calgary. He joins me now via Skype from Montreal. Welcome to the show, Ricardo. It's nice to have you on. Thanks for having me, Jeanette. Ricardo, in Canada, we often hear academics, politicians, and media pundits saying that we have a systemic racism problem in this country. I think we need to, first of all, have a working definition of what racism is and also what we mean by systemic. Uh, I totally agree with you there, Janet. Before engaging in any type of conversation, it's always a good practice to define our terms. So let, let's start with the word uh, racism. Uh, racism is the ideology that values one race o of, over the other. So that, that would be a broad definition of it. But uh, what does that mean concretely? Uh, how, how does it manifest itself in our societies? But uh, uh, we can focus on three forms that uh, racism takes. Usually uh, you can recognize it uh, in the form of uh, racial dogmas, uh, teachings, such as that would affirm racial superiority, uh, white supremacy, these type of things, or all, all types of idea of maintaining racial purity. Uh, another one would be uh, uh, racial biases. Uh, ma it manifests itself when people have uh, preconceived judgment or uh, unjustified fears or suspicion solely based on the race of the person they're interacting with. Uh, the, the, the third one would be uh, this idea of racial dominance. This is when uh, individuals or societies 
uh, treat uh, ethnic minorities such as uh, in in such a way to rule over them. And and this uh, last item would uh, uh, lead us to talk about uh, systemic racism, because when there is a racial dominance in a society, but this uh, uh, makes people question themselves as to why is there such a dominance of a, a one race o- over the other, and this could be uh, due to several factors, and uh, uh, many people think it would be due to uh, uh, systemic racism. So that would be the belief that uh, uh, due to conscious or unconscious uh, biases, uh, our governments, our institutions, or a legal system, they are producing racial disparities or, uh, or inequities. So when people are looking at the racial dominance, but they, they, they would ask themselves, is this due to uh, uh, unconscious biases? Or the, the, does it have to do with the fact that, uh, for instance, white people have been in this country for uh, over 400 generations and they have uh, 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 had plenty of time to establish themselves? So that the, this would be the working definition that we could go by. Hmm, interesting. Now, you said that your family is from Haiti and you've been living in Canada. So have you yourself experienced racism? Uh, I have. uh, Absolutely, I have. Uh, Nothing like the generation that came before me, the generation of my parents, when they were told uh, coming in this country that they don't rent apartment to N-words or these type of things. But... uh, uh, I, I've been asked to pay in a restaurant prior to ordering my food. Uh, I, I've been called uh, the N-word and other nasty words. Uh, I've been uh, racially profiled by either by the police or when you walk into a store, people start following you because they think you're going to steal. So these, these type of uh, uh, subtle uh, uh, events happen. Okay. So, Ricardo, you mentioned that you feel like you yourself have been racially profiled even by police. So, do you believe that there's mm-hmm. systemic racism in Canada then? Uh, actually, I, I do, but I, I think people are making it a, a, a much bigger deal than uh, what it is. And wh- when we're talking about uh, systemic racism, so we, we, we just said that this is a, a, a system that uh, unconsciously or consciously creates uh, inequities. And I, I definitely feel like, uh, for instance, in the police, there is such a thing as uh, systemic racism. This is not just a feeling, actually, it's, it's backed by uh, uh, studies here in Montreal, the, the city of Montreal had to come clean about the systemic racism inside the, the, their police service, and they've admitted the, that much. So uh, there, there obviously is, and the recent events uh, within the indigenous community uh, has shown here in Quebec that uh, uh, these people are uh, obviously suffering from uh, uh, some type of uh, discrimination. Now, what scares people is the word racism in the systemic racism there is obviously this uh, moral connotation and as canadians we don't feel like uh, we, we're associating this to what's happening what happened and still happening in uh, our southern border uh, in, in our neighbors but we, we we feel so different that we understand the, the stigma that is uh, attached to this word so the, 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 the maybe a better term would be systemic discrimination Okay, now, Ricardo, you had mentioned being called the N-word. So here in Canada, a University of Ottawa professor was recently suspended for two weeks for using the N-word in an educational discussion context. So since then, 34 other professors signed a letter of support defending critical thinking and academic freedom. However, student groups have condemned that letter and have called for a zero tolerance policy regarding the use of the N word. What are your thoughts on that, Ricardo? Uh, my, my opinion on this topic isn't these days, I would say that much, but uh, I, I really don't see why in an academic context, anyone can use the, the, the N word. Uh, we obviously can tell when someone is trying to insult somebody or when they're trying to teach us. So uh, uh, I, 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 
I, I want to refrain from commenting directly the case at the University of Ottawa because new infos have uh, uh, still been brought to light that have shown that maybe the teacher uh, has not done this for the first time. She might have done this in the past. So until I have all the, the infos on this, uh, I, I'll limit my comment to that. But I, I can say that... Uh, uh, I, I have yet to hear a persuasive argument to convince me that this word should be totally banned from our dictionary. I, I haven't read the, the, the letter that the students have. Uh, was it the students? I think it was the, the teachers that have drafted the, the, the letter I read. And I, I was not convinced by that. And if I might add, uh, uh, they claim to be speaking on behalf of uh, all black people, but that they, they, it is not true. There is not a black consensus on this issue. Of course, and that's where it needs to be, right? Interesting. Now, Ricardo, in the U.S., race has become such a divisive and often violent issue. But here in Canada, we don't see as much violence. Why is that? So uh, th there's a few reasons for this. And uh, I, I might say, I might start by saying that American history is deeply rooted in, uh, in racism, even to the point that Nazis were inspired by them when they started their, their, their pogrom against uh, Jews. So uh, today the debate has been uh, on racism is, has been polarized by uh, uh, two parties, the, those who see racism everywhere and those who are in complete denial of it. And uh, this is not a, a good mix for having a healthy dialogue. And uh, uh, the church has been uh, either completely silent on this issue when it should have been at the forefront of, of the fight. So uh, as for a long time, uh, 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 this is what has been happening. So when, when the situation uh, like the recent killing of George Floyd happened, uh, this uh, evidently uh, uh, led to a lot of violence. However, here in Canada, well, we, we haven't reached that boiling point yet. Well, we, we shouldn't be complacent and, until, uh, at, and wait until things erupt and get out of hands uh, uh, before we decide to address what's happening in our own backyard. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would say that the church and uh, our government need to listen to the complaints of ethnic uh, uh, diversities, ethnic minorities, especially those of the indigenous people. Ah, it's interesting that you mentioned the church too, and some say that Christianity is the white man's religion, and that's that that is racist, right? So, what does the Bible have to say about racism? Uh, but to this claim of the, uh, the the Christianity being the white man's religion, I would say that uh, the person who would uh, make such a claim is uh, uh, probably. Uh, ignorant of the, the history of Christianity and in history in general. Uh, for, for Christianity didn't start in Europe. It started in the Middle East among uh, uh, people of color. Uh, uh, white people received and converted to Christianity from, uh, uh, from paganism. They worshiped Thor or Odin or Zeus and uh, uh, these type of uh, other gods. Uh, and most uh, major theological developments uh, happened in Africa. So suffice it to say that uh, it is not a, a white man's religion. Now, as to the claim uh, uh, of uh, racism, uh, the, the Bible is clear on its position on racism. The Bible is against racism. Uh, the God we serve is a God that says that he's not a God of partiality. And he calls partiality a sin. He's a just God, and he commands us to practice justice. Uh, he, the, 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 the events in the early church have shown us that uh, God was uh, totally against this idea of uh, ethnic discrimination. It, it, took a lot to, uh, it took a lot for God to show the apostles that the Gentiles uh, were welcome into the church. And uh, since that point, it, it was... Uh, 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 the, 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 there was this big idea of racial reconciliation within the church, admitting the pagans into the flock and uh, understanding that we all uh, uh, sons and daughters of God. So uh, uh, the, the broad message of the Bible has at its core this idea of being one and uh, uh, this idea of uh, one, uh, uh, reconciliation among races. 
Hmm. So then what do you think the church needs to improve on when it comes to combating racism and reaching out to all racial groups? Uh, I would say the church needs to uh, learn how to communicate better with people who are uh, suffering from uh, racial prejudices. Uh, oftentimes, as a, a Christian, we have been quick to uh, respond, but uh, we're responding when we don't even totally understand the issue or the concerns of the people uh, uh, that are complaining about uh, uh, racial discrimination. So uh, communication is key. And uh, uh, being caring, being loving, uh, uh, showing people that we are compassionate, take actions. We have been quiet for too long and uh, we need to speak out loud, the, the, uh, as loud as we are on abortion and other uh, uh, social uh, justice issue. And we need to be biblical about this. There is a biblical foundation that uh, the, 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 the pastors, the priests uh, and church leaders, the uh, teachers, ha they have to be responsible about this. They have to show biblically to people why racism is wrong and make sure that this is a, a part of the teaching that the people are receiving. Let me ask you this, Ricardo, since it is election time and it's such a huge issue in the U.S., what are the pros and cons of the Black Lives Matter movement? Some people have been criticized for saying all lives matter. That's a very good question. Uh, for the pros, I would say, uh, first of all, BLM, Black Lives Matter, it listens to black people. And uh, it takes uh, action, the concrete action on behalf of black people. And uh, uh, the Black Lives Matter is only highlighting how much uh, the church has failed in some of this area. But the, the problem is that Black Lives Matter comes from a, a secular, is a, it's a secular, a secular movement. And it wants to address an issue of justice and morality, but they really don't have a foundation to ground their belief in justice and morality. Because without a, a God, there is no way to uh, uh, talk about a, an objective uh, uh, system of ethics. So it, it is a, a, a doom uh, uh, to fail. Now, uh, as for the uh, uh, All Lives Matter uh, response, it goes back to what I said a minute ago. We are quick to respond. And this answer only shows how much we don't listen to each other. Does anyone actually believe that uh, Black Lives Matter supporters disagree with the idea that all lives matter? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, let's take, for example, uh, if I would say that uh, the life of the unborn matters, no one would uh, respond to me, hey, hey, not only the life of the unborn, but all lives matter. No one would uh, give such a response. But we would immediately understand that I'm just narrowing down my focus on the onboard because I feel like he is the one that is in immediate danger. And this is what people mean when they say Black Lives Matter. And to respond, all lives matter is just to show that we do not understand the claim of the person. Wow. Well, Ricardo, it looks like we are out of time, but thank you so much on your thoughts on all of these issues. Ricardo Fortune, the Quebec Coordinator for Faith Beyond Belief, an apologetics organization based out of Calgary. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks, Jeanette. Canada's energy sector continues to struggle during the COVID-19 pandemic. Where are we headed when it comes to our country's oil and gas industries? Joining me now from Calgary is Cody Battersell, founder of Canada Action. It's volunteer-led grassroots movement encouraging Canadians to take action in support of natural resources sector. Cody, welcome back to Bridge City News. Thank you so much for having me again. I really appreciate the opportunity to be back with you. Oh, absolutely, Cody. Now, with current government oil and gas policies limiting investment and exports, do we have numbers really right now as to how much this is impacting the overall Canadian economy? What we know is that over the last several years, we have imported millions of dollars per day of uh, oil from other countries. We know that we have lost out on billions of dollars of potential government revenues. We know that we have lost out on investment and job creation to the tunes of hundreds of billions of dollars. And this is a part of the, the anti-pipeline campaign that has uniquely targeted Canada 
And now during this COVID crisis, we see that we need a strong, competitive energy industry more than ever to get our economy back on track and to support Canadian jobs for Canadian families. Why do you think it is that Ottawa is so anti-pipeline, especially when it comes to supporting Alberta's energy sector? They'd rather bring in oil from Saudi Arabia? Well, it's, you know, it's interesting because you have the Trans Mountain Pipeline that is moving forward, and that's very, very important. But when it comes to Energy East and when it comes to Northern Gateway, these are other projects that did need to get built for Canada to achieve full value for our resources, which benefits all Canadians. Additionally, with Energy East, we were going to be able to uh, upgrade and refine more of our oil, get more Western Canadian oil to Eastern Canadian consumers, and that would have displaced other foreign oil imports coming into the country, also allowing for us to export potentially into Europe and other countries around the world. We know that there's strong demand for our oil, our natural gas, and our resources around the world. Com countries want to do business with Canada, and we need to make sure that we have a competitive environment. I like to say that we should have an all-inclusive energy platform rather than a non-inclusive because it's great to support wind and solar, but we also need to be supporting oil and gas. So let's talk about some of those pipelines. You mentioned uh, Trans Mountain as well, Energy East, which is dead on the table, I guess. Which ones are up and running and which ones are still facing regulatory hurdles? Well, the important one right now that we see under construction is Trans Mountain. And Trans Mountain, they're, they're under construction in Kamloops. That pipeline, there's a lot of misinformation that's put out by the anti-pipeline groups. So the original project has been operating since 1950, uh, pardon me, 1953, marine shipments since 1956. There has never been a marine incident or a catastrophe. They are expanding the project now, which will get more Canadian oil into Burnaby, where we can then export that down into California or over into Asia. We are sending oil to Asia now, and it's so important that we diversify our customers as much as possible away from the United States so that we can get the best global price for our oil. Currently, just in the last couple of weeks, we have seen refiners in Spain and in India looking to buy Canadian oil. Now, the, the frustrating part, though, is that they're looking to buy it through the U.S. because we have not built enough of our own pipelines. So there's a good example of this missed opportunity. And going forward as a country, we need to be talking about how we're going to solve that. The other project that is already built in Canada, but it's still awaiting uh, some final, final permitting in the U.S. is the Line 3 project. That's actually just a replacement project for an existing pipeline to upgrade it to brand new modern technology. That's very important. As well, we still have Keystone XL, the saga of Keystone, um, under construction in some parts of uh, Canada and the U.S., including the border crossing, very important for North American energy security. And we've seen over the last 10 years, as long as Keystone has been opposed, global oil demand increased by about 10 million barrels per day until pre-COVID. And the biggest benefactors of the opposition to Keystone were Venezuela, Mexico, Saudi Arabia, Brazil, and Ecuador, countries that obviously do not support Canadian jobs, and also countries that often have inferior environmental, social, and, and governance standards. So a very important part of the conversation really is who benefits when Canadian pipelines are blocked. Cody Alberta Premier Jason Kenney has decided to lift the cap on crude oil production as of December. What does this really mean for the energy sector? Well, it means that there's some, some increased confidence now in pipeline capacity and in storage in Alberta because um, the curtailment was brought in to help manage the differential. If we can get Trans Mountain built, if we can get Line 3 finished, if we possibly get Keystone, plus there's some other pipeline maintenance and debottlenecking projects, if we can get increased pipeline capacity, we won't have to necessarily worry about the massive discounts, again, uh, the way that they were. I mean, at one point we were losing, uh, you know, $100 million a day. Um, selling the world's most regulated oil as a top producer with the most heavily discounted price. And there's a huge disconnect between those two, uh, those two statements. So um, this, this lifting of the curtailments is, is positive overall. We obviously want to see Alberta as an investment for, as a jurisdiction for investment, for job creation, and for continued 
uh, uh, growth in our oil and natural gas industry. And this is one step in that uh, sequence. So how would you respond to the objections from environmentalists on the decision to lift the cap? Well, there's just so many decisions and so many things that are being said by some of these groups. And let's be clear, all Canadians support the environment. But Canadians do not support giving opportunity and jobs that could be uh, benefiting our families and our communities to other countries with weaker environmental standards. The groups, the, the, a lot of these groups, they say they care about the climate, they say they care about the environment, but their actions do not match up with the words. Because if those two statements were in fact what they valued, they would be supporting Canadian energy getting to the world, Canadian energy production increasing, and they would also be having a balanced, constructive conversation about how we can continue working together to improve our environmental footprint, but they would recognize we are already leading on so many regards and so many metrics. And as Canadians, we really truly should be proud of our people, our resources, and our record. Any thoughts on the recent merger between Synovus and Husky, the $3.8 billion stock deal? Now we're talking about some serious job losses, around 2,000 positions, Cody. Yeah, and you know, it just, it's, it's so sad. And I just feel for everyone. I mean, we've been watching now for many years and um, you know, we need to get back to a position where Canada can compete internationally. Um, you know, we need to get back to a position where companies want to invest in Canada rather than leaving Canada. In this situation, I'm glad that the company, the headquarters is staying in Canada. Um, you know, it's not like Synovus could have invested in the U.S. or they could have invested overseas, but they did buy another Canadian or merge with another Canadian company. There are some positives, but that doesn't uh, diminish the serious impact to families. Um, and we need a strong energy sector so that we can grow jobs and grow opportunity for our communities again in the future. And hopefully a strong Synovus will be able to, uh, to do that in the years to come. Now there's some good news for Calgary. Suncor announced that they're moving their Ontario Petrocan head office to the Stampede City. That should affect around 700 workers. And the company says it will ensure that they remain competitive for the long term. How so? Well, we want our, our companies competitive. And so I think moving those, moving those, uh, that staff into, into Calgary, we have a lot of great office space. We have a great quality of life, you know, a great place to live. Um, we're going through some economic challenges. And so bringing these positions here, it might mean uh, potentially some local hiring if people can't move. And uh, anytime we hear jobs coming to Calgary, that's a good thing. And we hope to get back into that trend going forward for the future, because again, we have the people, we have the knowledge, the innovation, the ingenuity, the expertise, the experience, and we should be a choice jurisdiction for investment for any energy company anywhere in the world that cares about the environment. They should be doing business in Alberta and in Canada. You know, Alberta definitely has the infrastructure to support our energy industry. Cody, solar and wind energy only accounted for about 4% of total U.S. consumption in 2019. The green energy lobby says fossil fuels need to be scrapped as soon as possible. But at this rate, is that anywhere near realistic? It's not realistic. And this is not a conversation where we should be asked to choose between oil or solar, natural gas or wind. The reality is we need all of the above. And that's why we have to have this all-inclusive conversation. You cannot build a solar panel or a wind turbine without massive volumes of mined materials, oil and natural gas and other advanced uh, uh, you know, resources that, that have been come from the earth. And at the end of the day, we still know that right now we do not have the backup battery technology to store wind or solar energy when the sun's not shining and the wind is not blowing. So the reality is when you look around the world right now at where some of these intermittent renewables are, they're not there yet. And it is not fair, it is not honest to be telling people that we need to make this choice today because they themselves cannot make that choice. Oil, you know, it's been said that even in 2040, when all cars might be sold as electric vehicles, oil demand will still be around 2012 or 2013 levels because of plastics, petrochemicals, and other uses. So the, the, the fact is oil and gas are going to be 
critical parts of the global energy mix for decades to come. And if we don't invest in our own production, other countries will take that market share and the environment will be worse off. And if we don't invest, period, then we will have massive crippling shortages of energy and we will all experience what it was like to live 75 or 150 or 200 years ago without modern energy supply and the products that we all depend on that are derived from oil and natural gas. So with the continuing push for green energy though, Cody, many are saying that global demand for oil is dropping off the charts. But you know what? You and I have both seen what's happening in the United States, China, India. Nothing could be further from the truth. China's got record oil imports right now, year over year. Um, you know, you also have to address depletion. Every year the world loses some of the existing oil supply that runs out. If we don't invest in recreating that supply, even when demand is flat, we are going to have an a, a acute energy shortage. So um, oil demand when Keystone XL was, uh, was originally proposed was around 90 million barrels per day. And in February of this year, pre-COVID, oil demand was right around 100 million barrels per day. It dropped down to, say, 90 million. It's back up to 95, 96 right now. And back into 2022 or 2023, all of the major forecasting agencies expect oil demand will be back above 100 million barrels per day, and it will grow for at least another decade or two, and you have to replace depletion. So where should that supply come from? And for anyone who cares about the environment, human rights, worker safety, and for any Canadian that cares about Canadian opportunity, jobs, and prosperity, I firmly believe that we, the world needs more Canadian energy for those reasons. Cody, let's talk about coal for just a moment. Are you able to comment on the Grassy Mountain Coal Project in the Crow's Nest Pass? Is it possible to protect wildlife and the environment while at the same time creating hundreds of new jobs in the region? It's absolutely possible. That's the Canadian way. And if this project goes through a rigorous, thorough environmental uh, regulatory process, and if it's found to be in the public uh, economic interest in a way that can balance environmental protection, then it absolutely has merit. The reality is right now, global coal use is actually still growing. And we have thousands of new coal-fired power plants around the world. Plus, you also have metallurgical coal for making steel and other products that we all use every day without even realizing how they come to be. And so um, if we can produce Canadian resources to our high environmental standards and get that to the world, we create jobs for Canadians, we protect the local environment while also protecting the global environment with our leading standards. And so if the project uh, can, 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 can go through that process and uh, uh, is found to be uh, a balanced uh, between the two, then absolutely it could proceed. What is the overall outlook in 2021 for our energy sector? What are your thoughts? Well, I'm optimistic because there's been such, such a decline around the world in oil and gas drilling, uh, specifically oil drilling. You know, Norway has cut back substantially. The U.S. has cut back substantially. And so if demand, if we can get through COVID, um, and if demand starts to come back to, back to where it was, um, in the next one to two years, I think right now it looks like, and many market commentators would say that it looks like we could have a, a little bit of a, a supply shortfall. And it's a good opportunity for Canada because we have uh, well-regulated, environmentally progressive, um, long-life uh, uh, opportunities in the oil sands and in our conventional oil and gas industry with leading environmental uh, metrics to help meet that demand. And um, you know, we want to see we want to see rigs working. We want to see people employed. We want to see families successful, and also the economic opportunity. Uh, one stat that is absolutely mind blowing: from 2000 until 2018, the women and men who work in our oil and gas industry in the oil and gas sector generated 380 billion dollars for Canadian governments. That is an example of the foundational opportunity, the fundamental opportunity that our resource sector has been and can continue to be for our country. You would think maybe the Trudeau Liberals would realize, hey, we're sitting on a gold mine here in Alberta. Why not tap into it, help develop those resources and pay off some of our debt and get the deficit under control? We need our resources firing on all cylinders. You know, we need to support all jobs in all sectors. So 
support tourism, support tech, support manufacturing, but also support oil and gas and support energy in an all-inclusive manner. The, the fact is, oil and gas is one of the most tech-forward industries in the country. Resources account for such a huge part as well of our manufacturing base. The oil and gas industry does business with thousands of companies across Canada and is our largest export and has been the largest reason for our trade surplus over the last several years. So, um, you know, we are a resource nation. We are, we are a nation of amazing people, amazing animals, amazing places like our national parks and our natural resources that we have developed using Canadian innovation, Canadian ingenuity. And we need to be champions of this opportunity we have. Other countries call it a blessing and a gift. And it's so important that we all speak up in support of a balanced, constructive conversation about why the world needs more Canadian resources. Amen to that. Cody Battershill, founder of Canada Action. Thanks for joining me today from Calgary. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. And on behalf of all of us here at Bridge City News, I'm Hal Roberts. God bless and thanks for watching.